Kunikada, Akuni, Klat Gunasuwu, Ravens and Eagles, my friends, Kidsmans, their ancestors, welcome to the virtual Native Issues Forum for today's topic, the Southeast Alaska Landless Communities. And um, I will first introduce myself and then have our panelists introduce themselves next. Thank you, Shenach, Yanyani, Shuhat Duasak. Will Micklin, Hat Sushanaya, Tequidi Hatsate, Ach Nadaka Hidi Katsit, Tantaquan Ayahat, Ach Ish Hats Dleka, Ach Lech Has Sokwamish, Ach Lech Has Ganachadi, Ach Kani Yan Deshitan, Ka San Francisco, Ehat Yi Yidat. I wish to acknowledge Chusha, Dr. Elaine Abraham of the Owl House of Yakutet, is uh, give me my her father's name and Cyril George, who adopted my wife as Kanshawu of the Deshitan clan of Basket Bay. And today we'll begin with introducing our panelists. We always give the opportunity the best to introduce yourself rather than I. So um, why don't we start uh, with the panelists. Uh, Richard, do you want to start? Sorry, you're on mute. There we go. Okay. Um, I'm Richard Reinhardt. Duwani Kakmakle Yohat Duasak. Tashi yo hat du sak. Yeh na hat se ti. Kiksari aya hat. Gagan hit aya hat. Shut kwan hat se ti. I am uh, Richard Reinhardt. I am a Kiksari um, from the Sun House in Wrangell. And um, that's where I was, I was born in Wrangell, raised there. I currently live in um, Seattle with my family. But at this very moment, I'm actually in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, working for our business, Tlingit Hydro Tribal Business Corporation. And um, glad to be on this panel. I, the uh, landless has been a um, big thing for me my whole life. And, and so I just enjoy uh, speaking with you about it today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Todd? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm also a grandchild, uh, a grandchild of the Hlupnakari and the um, uh, Kachari. Uh, it's an honor to be here among you. I greatly appreciate the Tlingit uh, and uh, Central Council for, for this amazing ongoing series and, and uh, the privilege to, to, to present this important um, uh, landless uh, initiative. Um, I have the honor of serving as the campaign and the volunteer coordinator for the um, Southeast Alaska Landless uh, Corporation and I'm eager to, to greet you all and, and answer your questions today. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Cecilia? Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Colombian Spanish Yeti uh, Thank you, folks. My Tlingit name is Koyukchu, and I have another one, Hitle. I am of the Akdain Tan clan, Raven Moeti. I was born in Cake. I grew up in Petersburg. And that's how come I'm one of the uh, landless uh, shareholders. I am currently the Southeast Alaska Landless Corporation president. And we have, uh, as you know, five communities that were left out. And um, 
no one really knows why. So we're going to be putting all of the um, things that we know about the issue on the table today. I guess a lot of people don't know about this, that it's still an issue. But after 50 years, it does need to be made right. Punath Chish. Uh, Mr. Alan Mintz. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alan Mintz. I'm originally from Connecticut, but I now live just outside of Washington, D.C. And I've had the privilege of representing Alaska Native people in Washington, D.C. for 45 years. Uh, I started working on behalf of Sea Alaska and its shareholders in 1991 and have had the privilege of working with Sea Alaska and now with the Southeast Alaska Landless Coalition uh, over the past 20 years, uh, trying to bring uh, a, a conclusion to resolve this historical inequity that happened when Anxa passed and the five villages in Southeast were not recognized. So th thankful to you all for listening today and for having me here. It's an honor and a privilege to be with you and I hope we can answer any questions or concerns you might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Andrew Vanderjack. Uh, my name is Andrew Vanderjack and I grew up in Southeast Alaska. I grew up in Craig and Long Island logging camp uh, in Ketchikan and in Juneau. Uh, I also live in Washington, DC uh, and I am a partner at Van Ness Feldman uh, where I have worked for the last 13 years. I made my way to Washington, D.C. as an employee to Senator Ted Stevens uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, and I've been working with Alan uh, on this matter for the last uh, almost 14 years. Thank you. And unfortunately, um, the Honorable Randy Williams, uh, Ketchikan Indian Community Council member is not with us uh, today. Uh, we do miss his wisdom and expertise, and uh, I'm sure he'll be happy to answer any questions you may have or provide information should you run into Randy. Um, we miss him, so um, we will proceed. As you may have heard in my introduction, I'm Tantiguan or Tongas tribe. My family's from Kitchikin. Um, my uncle's in uh, Craig and uh, Heidelberg, and auntie's in... Uh, in Wrangell. So I'm an interested party and I uh, am eager to launch into our discussion among the many and specific inequities of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act uh, the, um, that the five communities were left out is perhaps one of the most egregious and uh, yet is one that can be readily uh, fixed if indeed we can get our federal partners to act on this. And, um, but that means uh, both community knowledge and support. And this forum is directed to providing the information so that our tribal citizens uh, and Alaska shareholders and friends and relations can all support the uh, recognition of the five landless communities under the Alaska Native Claims Set Settlement Act. Uh, so th with that, let's dive into the, uh, the topic and uh, moved on to the, the slides for the presentation. So um, uh, Alaska, when uh, Alaska Natives Without Land is an important uh, term, it's a description of the inequity that we are referring to and it is the phrase used by advocates uh, who petition uh, the, um, the Congress and the White House for restoration of the ancestral lands that are homelands, that are Aboriginal lands to Native communities forgotten by the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. And uh, the Southeast Alaska Landless Corporation or SALC and ind individual communities have united Native people uh, in this effort to uh, overcome the loss and restore uh, these recognition of these lands under uh, these communities under the, uh, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. So the first question uh, 
is about the phrase Alaska Natives without land and its, uh, its meaning for restoration of, of these communities. Does anyone want to uh, provide their, their take on what this means and how important this phrase is? Todd. Cecilia? No, I was just gonna call on Todd. Oh, Todd, please. Oh, good enough, uh, Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, I, Alaska Natives Without Land uh, was the culmination of years and years of outreach to the more than 4,400 uh, landless uh, brothers and sisters, uh, listening to their um, pain and suffering of not being acknowledged under the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act and uh, taking their words, their heart, their, their stories, um, not only their own, but of those of their uh, grandmothers and grandfathers that, have, that they have, they've lost uh, since this fight began and was developed to help people understand the, the, the depth and breadth of what, this, what it means to not be recognized under ANCSA to not have this small portion of our original homelands of Ha'ani back in their ownership. And I'll, I'll just use a, um, a quick anecdote from uh, one of our representatives in, um, in Petersburg. She talked about how difficult it's been, um, how painful it's been to not have been recognized for 50 years, but amongst that pain in seeing how close we are to potential resolution in Congress and recognition, how excited she is to see about what our, our next generations will do with this land once they receive it. She knows how much it's, how, how big a part of it is to our identi identity, to our ability to strengthen our communities, to participate in economic development, uh, to contribute on um, uh, in the preservation and, and continuation of our, of our precious heritage and culture. Uh, there's so many facets that while well, there's there's a lot of pain from the past, there's a lot of hope and optimism for the future. So that we hope to see the Alaska Natives without lands to be to we look forward to the day where it becomes the Alaska Native uh, Alaska Natives with land at, at, at its conclusion. So good luck, Chish. Thank you, Cecilia. The uh, mission statement of the Alaska Natives uh, without land. Uh, has a statement within it that uh, they are working to reunite Native people with a small portion of their ha homelands. Uh, can you just give us your take on what that means and um, uh, why it says a small portion? Yes. Um, first, I would like to, since it's already been brought out and mentioned along with Alaska Natives Without Land, and we do work together, the Southeast Alaska Landless Corporation, in order to uh, present ourselves as in um, Washington, DC, each of the five communities formed a nonprofit corporation, with seven board members each. And of those uh, seven board members, two were selected from each community. And that uh, is what comprises the, what we call the umbrella corporation covering all of the five communities, Southeast Alaska Landless Corporation. And uh, for the rest of the state of Alaska, they received a lot more land than what um, Southeast received. Each of the communities, um, village and urban corporations, the two, Sitka and Juneau, uh, received only 23,040 acres or one township, whereas the rest of the state received a lot more land. And I believe that's partly due to the Clinton and Haida settlement, but also uh, it, Tongass National Forest. Um, yeah, we're in a national forest. And we were here way before that national forest was formed. So um, yes, we would like to get some of our Tlingit Ani back, not just for our five communities, but we have relatives in all of the other communities. So it's like, since all of Southeast Alaska was Tlingit Ani, say it was all red when we owned it. And then when the uh, uh, Westerners came and formed the uh, 
uh, National Forest in the early 1900s, I believe it was 1906, close. So uh, all of that turned, for lack of a better color, I could say blue, but I'll say white. And so now there's little patches of red, that's Flinget Ani. And so if we could add another 115,000 plus acres back in our native ownership, the way it used to be, uh, under our stewardship, um, that's a good thing. It's uh, there's a lot of people that don't want public land going into private ownership, though. So, um, but it's only fair because that's what all the other native communities received, and we all have um, historic ties to the land: um, uh, Ketchikan, Wrangell, Petersburg, Haines, and Tenakee. So, we shouldn't be treated any differently than all the other communities. So that's what we're. Um, it's something, at least it's something for the taking of our lands. So thank you. And Richard, can you give us a brief summary of angst uh, within the context of the landless communities? Well, first I'll, I'll uh, have to apologize because I'm Tlingit and I don't do anything really brief. Um, most people think of, uh, our land claims, they think of it in terms of, um, you know, since 1971. And I think of it a lot further. I, I know a lot of the people listening today are, um, are native people and have maybe a more similar perspective to me, but I'm gonna go through it anyway. This is something that I usually tell to um, senators, congressmen and various people that wanna listen. We've been on this land since time immemorial. We like to say that, but what does that mean? That means we were here before the first ice age. And again, when the ice first receded, we have songs and stories of our people going under and over the glacier to get to what is currently our homeland. We were here before the great flood and have stories of our people climbing the mountains to escape the floodwaters. We have place names for those mountains. Those stories are thousands and thousands of years old, but we don't just have ancient stories and songs. We have scientific proof of our people being here for at least 10,000 years. This is older than Western civilization as we know it. We have several, several other stories about specific places belonging to specific clans. Many of those are hundreds of years old and older than the United States of America. It is hard for most people to think in clinker terms. You know, you must think in a very long-term perspective. Old growth forests are beautiful and 500 year old trees are impressive. And we have much respect and reverence for them too but please keep in mind, our people have been on this land since before the oldest trees and oldest forests existed. Our people were here when the mountaintops and valley floor, floors were first formed. To understand Tlingit in our connection with the land, you have to understand how things were viewed. Everything had a spirit. The mountaintops had a spirit, and we have stories of that protecting our people. The uh, sea and the forest that provided our food um, and our shelter, they, they had spirits. And, and, and a lot of, in Tlingit, it was known, um, we had a concept of Atu, and many of you are familiar with that. The Atu is the most prized possession of the clan, but it's not just, um, it's not just regalia, and it's not just um, emblems and symbols. It also meant the land. Um, it, it also referred to the mountaintops. And it, it really literally meant something that was paid for, bought and paid for by the clan, oftentimes paid for in blood. Um, and and we have a lot of stories about that. When you take away our land, you've taken away our Atu and a vital connection that we have with our spiritual environment. You've cut us off from our spiritual relationship with the land and made us spiritually destitute. And that is something that non-native people do not really understand, that connection that we have to the land. And I, I, I think most all of you listening do know that and do understand that. Now, for the brief history, <laughs> um, we started lobbying Congress back in 1890 when uh, we sent an attorney named Willoughby Clark back to Washington, D.C. To, to lobby for, for our lands that we thought were wrongfully taken. Uh, the AMB was formed in 1912, and in 1915, uh, Alaska Native Sisterhood Camp 1 was formed in Wrangell. In 1920, the AMB convention was held in Wrangell at the AMB Hall there and attended by William and Lewis Paul. Uh, the Pauls would, would become, you know, big advocates for what actually became the uh, Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act in 1971. In, um, 
1922, Tilly Paul Tamry and Charlie Jones um, were arrested for voting at the polls in Wrangell. At a trial in the fall of uh, 1923, William Paul used the toilet paper defense to prove that he was civilized, that Charlie Jones was civilized, that he also you know, he owned a home, paid taxes, used a fork and a knife, et cetera. And in 1924, natives were given the right to vote. So I'm telling you all this to show that in these communities, Wrangell and Ketchikan and the other communities, we have been actively involved all along. Um, 1925, <clears throat> the, there was a literacy test passed and William Paul again brought suit and uh, um, won the right for natives to go to uh, public schools. In 30, 1934, the first meeting of Tlingit Haida Central Council was held in Wrangell in the EB Hall. Um, the Goldschmidt Hawes report was in, the, in 1946 and it, documented the um, possessory rights and, and the, you know, the existence of um, the, the native communities and all five communities that, that are here. In um, 1954, William Paul brought suit against the U.S. government in Teotihuacan versus the United States. Um, he ultimately lost that, but a, a lot of the dissenting opinion is what ended up being in Anxa later on. 1965 or 1966, Wrangell um, voted to go with the Central Council. In 1968, we had the, the uh, TNH settlement. And in 1971, Anxa passed and the five landless communities were left out. Since then, the first landless bill, and, and part of why we, we went with Alaska Natives without land is we hate to call ourselves landless. Um, but the first landless bill was um, introduced by Frank, Senator Frank Murkowski. Um, since then, I, I believe we've had five more bills, and I think this is our sixth bill of um, trying to fight for this. It's been going on for far too long. In that time period, over half of our shareholders have, have passed on, um, and we want to get this done before the rest of us all passed. Sheesh. Sheesh. So when uh, um, we say landless five, that's a term often used by advocates, um, what are we referring to? I think the next slide will show yeah, the map. Anyone want to take that on? Todd? It, yeah, Gunachishia and Yisha. So the five communities uh, consist of Haines, Ketchikan, Petersburg, Wrangell, and Tenneke Springs. And each of these communities has, uh, back to what Richard was saying earlier, you know, place names, um, uh, stories going back millennia. Uh, they have, you know, long established the uh, Tlingit uh, uh, villages and communities and really no different than the other 12 uh, communities in the region or the 200 villages really throughout Alaska that were recognized under uh, under the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. So five communities overlooked. There's Congress has never been able to articulate why they were omitted or why, um, nor have they been able to, to distinguish any difference. Uh, and uh, it's, it, you know, th th there's more and more support uh, with every mounting day. There's the, the inequity mounts, and therefore uh, mm -hmm. it's beyond time for its passage. Thank you. Now, I recall, I believe it was in the 90s, the uh, U.S. Congress commissioned a study to determine, um, uh, to examine the question of the, the, these five communities omitted from from Anxa, and uh, I they I don't believe they reached a conclusion as to why. They just that uh, they are eligible uh, to be included under Anxa. So perhaps that's a question for Richard and Cecilia. Uh, what are the eligibility eligibility criteria for Anxa villages or uh, urban corporations? How's that determined, and how does that um, uh, affect the community's application for our petition for recognition. Well, I'll start that. And then if Cecilia could uh, catch what I miss, sure. your, your chart up there shows a lot of it. And a lot of um, why I explained 
the earlier section the way I did was because of this. Um, so the first one is settled prior to arrival of whites. All these places, we, we literally were there when the ice receded and, and we've been there ever since. We have our migration stories. We have every, every community has a number of place stories of how they got there and how long they've been there and, and why. Um, the Alaska Native Brotherhood and Sisterhood, that was another one I referred to. Um, these communities were all involved with, with the Alaska Native Brotherhood and Sisterhood from, from the beginning, from the very beginning. Um, occupancy in the area, you know, uh, it's really um, well documented and not even disputed at all. The Native cemeteries and graves. Um, in 1971, there was more proof than there is today, and I can talk about Wrangell a little better than the other communities, but um, I, I know that the sharing our knowledge is coming to Wrangell this fall and Bob Sam is heading out there to check out the cemeteries and work with them. And, and I was just talking with him about it earlier this week. Um, there are cemeteries there. The totems, there's a lot less than when I grew up as a kid. You know, I was 11 years old when Anxa passed in 71. Um, a lot of the totems that were standing then are not standing anymore. But at the time when, when this all went through, they, they were there. So um, I, th I think the, um, the one thing that a lot, some of the communities didn't meet was that it had to be pre predominantly a native community. And in Wrangell's case, Petersburg, Ketchikan, and Haines, I don't think they met that. However, there was this um, urban corporation that um, designation that like uh, Juno with Gold Belt and Sitka with Sciatica and, and uh, Kenai and Kodiak all came under. And, under those criteria, those communities would have would have met that um, that requirement. Mm -hmm. okay. Cecilia, I don't know what I missed, but you, maybe. Well, I I was also going to mention that um, yes, our communities um, didn't match the village corporation criteria, which was a uh, native population needed to be the majority. However. Um, I believe it was kind of towards just before the bill was about to uh, pass, uh, the creation of urban corporations was established. And, and the, uh, so the two in Southeast Alaska, which our five communities would have certainly uh, qualified for was um, Juno and Sitka, of course, as uh, Richard mentioned, but also up North, they have uh, Kenai and Kodiak. So um, they have historic uh, native presence there as well. However, the native population was not the majority. And how, how can it be your fault if uh, non-native people really like your area and they move in there? So uh, they became the uh, majority. Uh, in Juneau at the uh, Alaska Historical Library, I personally saw it, there was a box full of papers. I'm quite certain they're all, all been digitized uh, since, but uh, in the upper corner, there was a, a forest service employee that wrote uh, in ink, just Haynes does not qualify because uh, native is native populations, not the majority. So they clearly were going by that criteria at that time. However, had they opened it up for our communities, we would have been, uh, afforded the same opportunities that all the other communities received. So we're, uh, we're hopeful. We're still hopeful. Thank you. Thank you. So a question for our legal experts, Andrew and Alan. Um, could you comment on uh, whether these communities once added, uh, would they be considered ANCSA villages or urban corporations? I can answer that one. Uh, this is Alan Mintz, Washington, D.C. Council. Uh, the way the legislation has been put together, uh, as Cecilia just said, uh, these villages look much like the towns in Juneau and in Sitka back in 1971. Uh, and the study that was done in the early 90s by the Institute of Social and Economic Research, University of Alaska, basically went through and compared these five villages in 1971 to the to Juneau and Sitka and said there really isn't much difference between the, those two sets of villages. Uh, so the notion would be that each of the five villages would create an urban corporation that would look like Gold Belt or Sciatica for Juneau or Sitka. 
they'd have all the rights of an urban corporation uh, under ANCSA uh, and would receive the same amount of land, one township or 23,040 acres, uh, just like those urban corporations in Juneau and in Sitka. So they would look the same and they'd have all the rights and privileges. The shareholders would remain uh, shareholders of Sea Alaska. Uh, and so to the extent that Sea Alaska receives 7i revenue from other native corporations, uh, they would still receive those uh, payments as at-large shareholders because the urban corporations shareholders do not get 7J payments. Uh, and I'm happy to answer more questions, but that would be the, the quick overview. They would look just like Gold Belt and Sciatica. Thank you. Andrew, anything to add? No, I don't, I don't think much to add. Just going back to the previous question very briefly, I would only note that uh, it's, uh, essentially established loose criteria that villages to be listed in AXA uh, had to have a population of at least 25 Alaska Native individuals, the non urban in their character, uh, and, um, and, and predominantly. Native, native in character. While, while those, those were the criteria that were spelled out by Congress, Congress addressed, addressed uh, other villages, villages throughout Alaska, Alaska including, including in Southeast, Southeast Alaska, Alaska in an equitable fashion, fashion uh, and make, make things sort of work for other communities. communities. Andrew, you went on mute. I'm not sure how that happened. Sorry about that. Uh, so, 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 for example, a Kassan in, in Saxman had predominantly non native populations as we supported in Congress at the time. Uh, and, and yes, we see that we're, we're listed as villages. And, and, and yeah, Andrew, your, um, your voice connection pretty rough. It's hard to understand. Yeah, you need to reboot, Andrew. Yeah, you need to reboot. Yeah, maybe you can reconnect. We'll come back. Um, so, uh, so the question for Richard then, uh, what are the benefits of being included in ANCSA for these communities? They're, they're primarily economic related. Um, you know, of, of course, the shareholders of these communities are, are members of Sea Alaska. Um, but if you look at the other communities around Southeast Alaska that have uh, village corporations and urban corporations, they've enjoyed over the last 50 years a substantial amount of dividends that the um, shareholder generated from their local um, properties that the shareholders of the landless communities have not. Uh, a lot of times opponents of ours will, will point out, they'll say, well, as urban and at large, you receive a bigger 7i seven, seven or 7j payments than the village corps and, and the difference there is really the um, 7J passes from Sea Alaska Corporation to the village corporation and then it is up to the village corporation to distribute it out to their shareholders. So um, that that money is is distributed um, differently but um, financially it's, it's uh, virtually the same. Um, I, I see it as mostly an economic and community development um, difference. And, and the things that are listed on the slide, you can see their dividends, scholarships, uh, culture camps, and things like that, that the um, communities that have received their land are able to provide, and the landless communities are not. Thank you. And maybe this is a question for Alan. Um, in the context of what changes we'd see if, if this bill were to pass and to go in, in, into effect, uh, um, other than, well, certainly the uh, uh, the benefit to the uh, shareholders of these new communities uh, uh, recognized under ANCSA, but would it have an effect on the existing village and regional corporation? Would it diminish their assets or interest to any extent, or would it have uh, not? Would it not have an effect on the value of? Uh, Silasco or the, the village corporations in Southeast. Thank you for the question. 
Uh, the answer is it would have no impact on Sea Alaska or the other village corporations. Uh, it would not change the relationship of the shareholders from the five communities. They would remain at large shareholders of Sea Alaska, uh, but they would also have shares in their urban corporation, just like the those from either the two urban corporations in Southeast or the village corporation shareholders in other villages in Southeast. Uh, but in terms of impact on them, uh, the only impact would be on a stronger land base for native people in Southeast Alaska uh, with 115,000 acres transferred to the five communities uh, and the benefits that might accrue to the greater Southeast economy. But in terms of impact on Sea Alaska, it, was, it would only be to the benefit of everybody uh, in Southeast with the economic development that might occur on these lands, but otherwise no effect. So then a question for Todd, um, is there another side, another argument, uh, another side of this, uh, uh, to this issue? Uh, do people believe that these five communities should not be a part of ANCSA? Have you heard uh, arguments to the contrary? And if so, what, what are they? Well, Thank you. Well, one of the things that I so appreciate about the, the leadership from the, the five landless communities is their how um, uh, proactive they've been in reaching out to not only their five communities, but but to to uh, stakeholders throughout the region to uh, understand what issues, what questions um, they might have around this legislation to uh, build bridges, to to find opportunities to be able to move forward in a, in, in a positive way and really mitigate uh, and hopefully remove any opposition. Now, that's not to say that some of the historic um, bills that have been introduced uh, in, in the past were not, you know, did receive some opposition from certain groups, certainly conservation a number of years ago, were uh, some, some conservation groups were highly active uh, against, but we've seen a real change in um, uh, in those relationships uh, through the years. And we're real hopeful that, uh, that uh, we recognize or can, that we can, that all the various stakeholders can recognize the commonality amongst each other, the common good and, and, and what, the, what the shared values are that, that can contribute to, uh, to finding a, a, a broad support base. The other, the second thing that we hear most common uh, in terms of concern is access. Uh, you know, Senator Murkowski is, uh, she, she always says, you know, every, every acre of the Tongass is precious. Well, certainly it's, it's, it's precious to us as native people, um, and, but there are other parties that are very, very curious about any land parcels that might be included in this legislation. What does that mean to, to my ability to recreate there, to gather food, uh, to, um, have have the you know the opportunities that I had when it was under federal ownership, and there's um, actually uh, new language within this proposed legislation that would guarantee uh, access for recreational um, uh, and non-commercial use of these areas, and that was a very purposeful ask of the landless communities of of the delegation to include language like that because of what they heard from these third parties. And I'll just finish one more brief um, item, if I may, um, Vice President Mickland, is the, there is a perception by some people that a deal's a deal. And uh, uh, what they don't recognize is that ANCSA was an imperfect uh, piece of legislation, much like, like or, or law, much like many other laws are. And like any other law, they're amendable. And ANCSA has been amended more than 100 times since its inception. This is another example of being able to continue to improve upon it and to uh, recognize this, uh, this congressional mission. So um, th thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. I see Andrew's back. So a question for Alan and Andrew. Um, can you describe the, uh, the, the bill that's entitled Unrecognized Southeast Alaska Native Communities Recognition and Compensation Act and give us an update about, what, uh, about its uh, current status? Uh, Andrew? Sure, I'd be happy to. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, perfectly, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, uh, going back to, to uh, the, the, my previous comment where I got garbled just very briefly, uh, what I wanted to say was that, you know, this notion that there are these criteria is a little bit of a red herring. Uh, in ANCSA itself, the general criteria for villages that a community must have a majority native population 
did not in any way prevent Congress from extending recognition to other traditional Native communities uh, throughout Southeast Alaska. In fact, every other traditional Alaska Native community of which we are aware, um, notwithstanding uh, the fact that one that a community might not meet uh, that criteria. And we saw that in the context of four communities that had become urbanized uh, as a result of an influx of uh, non-native population uh, from the lower 48 uh, by the Americans or, or by the Russians prior to that. Um, other urbanized Alaska Native communities like Nome too were able to establish a village corporation. So it really begs the question, why these five communities? Uh, the legislation that you've referred to is the, the, the uh, most recent iteration of legislation introduced on behalf of the five communities. Uh, the legislation has now been introduced in the current Congress by Congressman Don Young. Uh, we expect it to be introduced by uh, our senators later this summer. Uh, they are taking the opportunity uh, in early June to visit each of the five communities uh, to have conversations with uh, landless shareholders, as well as community leaders in each of these communities in advance of introduction. Uh, one of the reasons the bill is being introduced a little bit later is that uh, the senators introduced uh, a virtually identical piece of legislation at the end of the year last year, and they were able to hold a hearing on that legislation before the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, uh, and they feel that they're now doing their, their due diligence uh, to respond to some of the uh, comments, uh, concerns uh, received from stakeholders uh, throughout Southeast Alaska. The legislation, as Alan articulated, would establish five new urban corporations for each of the five communities. The legislation then goes through in some detail uh, what that means uh, uh, for each of the communities to the extent that those urban corporations are treated in any manner different uh, than the urban corporations established by ANCSA. And Todd spoke to one of the fundamental differences, uh, and that is this provision related to public access. Uh, the landless leadership uh, made a decision last year uh, in recognition of the interests of uh, the non-shareholders in the communities, the, the other folks who use these lands uh, to make the lands available for public access, uh, subject to certain restrictions that are appropriate for the urban corporation as land uh, owner to have, for example, the urban corporations would be able to protect uh, uh, cemetery and historic sites, other sacred sites on the lands, notwithstanding these public access provisions. All in all, there are about six pages, believe it or not, of language within this legislation uh, devoted to spelling out what that public access looks like. Uh, so there are no questions for uh, others in the communities who have an interest in uh, what the conveyance of land out of public ownership means for those communities. Thank you. Thank you. And um, this question for the advocates um, for the uh, Southeast Alaska Landless Corporation and the Alaska Natives Without Land. Uh, if you give it and give us a uh, summary of what activities you're involved in and uh, what you're doing to support the bill. That be Cecilia and Richard. Uh, I'll let Cecilia take the lead on that if she could. Maybe perhaps she can't. She is not able to. I can start. Um, uh, she was just uh, muted. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Cecilia. I didn't realize I was muted. Well, I just would like to say that we are um, most appreciative of all the folks uh, who are not actual um, shareholders of our five communities that are helping out with this issue. Alaska Native Brotherhood and Alaska Native Sisterhood certainly seem to be a good fit. I mean, and I've gone to them and we submit a resolution every year. Same thing with Clinkett and Haida, uh, Alaska Federation of Natives, National Congress of American Indians, all the native groups that we can think of it, um, including um, uh, certain corporations, um, uh, village uh, and urban. But um, one of the things that uh, I like to point out is how many billions of dollars our corporations bring into the state of Alaska. 
And it's not just the shareholders that are uh, or the uh, Native community that's benefiting from this. It's the whole community. Um, everyone in Alaska is benefiting from this. And so with the addition of five more communities um, uh, involved in economic opportunities, uh, possibly joint venturing, who knows? You know, um, we have young people who are a lot more environmentally um, uh, aware and concerned um, than uh, the logging that took place way back in the early 70s or the 70s. Uh, I, I recall hearing in the 80s about the two 50 year contracts with Japan and so a lot of that logging activity that was going on was um, in the backyards of most of our five communities. And well, it was the Forest Service that was doing it. The, I understand that uh, the, land, uh, the timber was sold at a loss. Uh, US government was subsidizing that effort. So there was an economic game already in play and they didn't want natives coming into the backyards of those communities and upsetting the apple cart, so to speak. So, um, now it's our turn. Uh, we don't want to cut trees, um, not to say we don't know what the uh, board members of these uh, new corporations will um, decide to do. However, I know that a lot of the young people, like I said, are very environmentally conscious. Um, and uh, even with Sea Alaska uh, doing um, uh, business, helping, helping with the uh, um, the land of the sea and getting involved with food. So, you know, who's to say where our corporations will go? Um, hopefully we're going to be um, continuing to work with Alaska Native Brothers and Alaska Native Sisterhood. I authored a, uh, a resolution years ago uh, forming an ad hoc committee so that the boots on the ground, so to speak, uh, would be working with the uh, landless uh, board and just coming together to touch the whole community and make them aware of this, that it's still going on and not to give up hope. So that's what I have for that. Thank you. And Richard, perhaps you can follow up with uh, and describe ways that um, tribal citizens, our relations and friends uh, mm -hmm. can uh, support this act and um, uh, what partners and supporters are now working uh, together with uh, the, uh, the coalitions. Certainly, uh, you can see, I think Cecilia covered a lot of this on, the, um, on what she just said. We've always had support from AFN and uh, National Congress, American Indians, a &B, a and B, Plinkett and Haida. <clears throat> I think the area, and I've spoken a number of times about how we can help. Send in a letter to our delegation, to Congressman Young or Senators uh, Murkowski and Sullivan. Uh, I think it's helpful in that they um, can use those numbers to say we received X amount of letters, but we don't need to change their opinion. They're, they are fully supportive, fully on board, and, and have, have been by introduction of these bills. Um, if you live in a state like in Washington state where I live, where we have senators who aren't supportive, sending letters to them is uh, helpful. And in, in some, Oregon, I know we have a number of shareholders, tribal members there, also helpful. But where I really think um, where we can make more difference from what I've seen um, over the past few months here, while well, we've been out meeting um, with the communities would be to, to uh, Talk with your local assembly members, your, your local um, city and, and borough assembly members, and, and let them understand that, you know, why you support it and that you are in support and let them know that there are people that um, are in support of this bill. We, we have um, some communities are very supportive and some are less so. Uh, as was noted earlier, um, Senator Murkowski's staff is going to be coming up into Southeast Alaska to the communities uh, very shortly. Show up at those meetings if you can. Voice support for us. It will help. It will make a difference. That absolutely will make a difference if you can um, be a part of that. It will make a difference if you can be a part of the um, 
the voice in favor when, when there are uh, city and borough meetings. Um, I'm gonna mention one person in, in particular that I, I just really like what he's done, Will Ware. Whenever he gets up at Petersburg Assembly, he is a very powerful advocate. So be like Will and, and um, do what you can. Gunnar Sheesh. Thank you, Richard. And uh, success will uh, look like a bill that passes through both houses of Congress and signed by the president and um, signed into law. So that uh, would be a great outcome. We are now at a point where we are um, be looking to uh, questions uh, from our Facebook live streaming audience. And uh, I've got a couple of questions here. One from Cynthia Flood uh, about how uh, these uh, five community corporations, if successful, would affect other, the regional and village corporations. And I think that was answered by Alan in that it would have no effect. In fact, it would be an uh, uh, improvement in um, uh, to the interests and values of all Southeast uh, uh, citizens by the economic effect and the social and community improvements that these corporations would bring. Um, from Clarice Johnson, it's a very specific question. Um, she's asking for an explanation on the meaning under the prior bill on selection of land uh, that refers to selecting land to be withdrawn and conveyed pursuant to uh, that section in the bill that gives preference to land with commercial purposes. Question is what commercial purpose in the bill does that refer to? Does it mean logging, mining, and other types of uh, extractive industry? Or is it um, what it brings best value, current value to the corporation? We'll all start with that. And, and I think perhaps um, Andrew or Alan might be really good to answer on that. Uh, it could mean that. It, it definitely could mean extractive industries. It could possibly mean logging. But, you know, I think if you look at the logging infrastructure in Southeast Alaska and you look at the world market for timber, you might find that that's not necessarily um, a, a high likelihood to produce the best financial results. Um, it does refer to place economic development and, and economic community and community development uh, is part of the plan. There are a number of other things that can be done besides extractive industries. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing those throughout um, Southeast in um, some things like um, uh, aquaculture, you know, kelp farming or oyster farming are, are some, some things. Um, Eco-tourism and cultural tourism are, are another way to go. Um, if we looked at logging, it's possible, you know, there could be like a small mill logging, a small operation that only takes a few trees per year and is very much on a sustainable basis. So I think we need to um, not so much look at what was done 40 years ago and 30 years ago. It probably doesn't apply. Other extractive industries, you know, we know where there, there's gold, we know where there's silver and copper and iron and all those uh, ores under, under the um, native lands, whether it's Sea Alaska or Village Corp. Um, and then you probably should just ask why hasn't anything been done? It's not economically feasible and it's not very likely. And I don't think any of the five communities are considering um, mining as an option. Um, it's always a possibility, but uh, it doesn't seem highly likely to me. So somebody else can answer further, please. Yeah, if I can jump in, uh, the language that, that you're referring to is in a previous bill when there had not been any land identified specifically. And so the, the question was going to be, where would the lands be selected and, and for what purposes and from what lands uh, could the corporation select uh, a township apiece? Uh, the current legislation that got introduced both last fall and again by Congressman Young this month uh, has maps attached so that everybody could see uh, the likely lands that the corporations had identified as available for their selection. Uh, so everybody could have a sense of where those lands were uh, and what purposes they might be put to. Uh, and I would emphasize, as both Todd and Andrew have said, uh, that one of the bigger concerns that we have faced in the past is a concern over access to those lands when, when and if they are conveyed to the 
new urban corporations. Uh, and there's very explicit language in the proposed legislation that makes clear that the native corporations will, will allow continued public access to those lands uh, unless there's a cultural reason to prevent access to a particular place uh, or if there's a safety or a health reason. Uh, for example, if there was a timber operation going on, obviously you can't have people going for hikes where the timber operation is happening. But other than that, the lands would remain open to public access. Uh, so that's why we've now included maps uh, in the legislation so everybody could see the specific lands that are at issue here. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I have a question from Albert Reinhardt. Hi, Albert. Um, and he uh, mentions that, uh, oh, well, I wasn't much younger than him when the bill passed almost 50 years ago. And he's, uh, his question is, it's uh, time to pass it before we all get much older. And uh, his question is, is there any leverage that it, we now know that we can use to help pass this bill? No. Well, the, the, I think if I could just suggest something, then ask maybe Alan and Andrew if, if um, I'm not sure specifically if he's talking about political leverage or, or not. But I think one one aspect of that uh, where Congress is really taking pause is the mounting inequity. You know, with every passing day, uh, the inequity gets larger as each of the other 12 or 200 village and urban corporations conduct business employ shareholders, uh, uh, pay dividends, um, stand up cultural and heritage programs, uh, uh, strengthen the tax base of their communities, um, uh, uh, employ, you know, third party um, uh, professionals and, 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 uh, uh, and consume products, you know, as a result of doing business. I mean, all of these, all of these benefits to the individual shareholders of those corporations, as well as their communities where they exist, they've enjoyed that for 50 years now. And so how much larger does that inequity have to be in order that for there to be um, um, action? And, and I think that is, that's a sense of leverage that, that these five communities have. Um, it's, they are no different than, than our brothers and sisters and the 200 other communities that, that have their lands. And well, well, I say that if I may, um, well, I, I, I was reflecting on a, a tribal assembly a couple of years ago, it was either two, 2018 or 19, I believe, when uh, Grand President Jackson of the AMB uh, came before the body and uh, made a call to action uh, to, to the tribal assembly to support a resolution for the landless. And what he said so moved me um, in that he said, I personally am a shareholder of a village corporation. I have my land. And he looked out among the body and he said, many of you are, are shareholders of villages and urban corporations and have your land. He said, we should be, those of us who have our land should be fighting for this more so than even the landless themselves because of this inequity. Our brothers and sisters are no different than us. And what we have been able to enjoy, they, they so deserve um, to as well. So we should be standing up and shouting louder and from the high, uh, higher mountaintop on, on their behalf. And I, I, I really appreciated his, his words. And we've, we have, you know, Cecilia, you mentioned earlier, the, the numerous, we, we've received thousands of letters of support from shareholders and non-shareholders alike, landless and, and those with land alike, native and non-native alike. So I think the more people, the more we build that, that, that sense of, of, of understanding, the, the leverage of our voice our shared voice, our unified voice is, is going to carry the greatest power in Congress. Thank you, Todd. Well, one of the things I, th I think is important that they hear is that we haven't given up and that we're not going away. That is starting to resonate. Um, the fact that we're still here and we're, we're you know, hitting it again and again, um, and that they know that we're not giving up. And when they start hearing from the next generation, they, they start believing, you know, it was, uh, I, I referenced William Paul earlier when I was speaking, who was my father's uncle. Um, you know, obviously he's passed back in 77. 2011, my, my father died and he, he, you know, on his deathbed, I promised him I'd keep fighting this 
and, and, and I will. Um, and then I don't know how many of you seen it, but uh, Alaska Natives Without Land published a, a, a interview with, with my son Levi, and he's a pretty strong advocate too. So when we have our opponents see that and they see this generational fight, they know we're not going to give up. And we need to make that very clear to everyone that we're going to keep hitting this and hitting it over and over again until it gets done. So don't give up. Keep pushing. We'll get there. Going to sheesh. Thank you. So um, there are other questions that uh, we have received that we will reply to by direct message. I see Daphne Alby asked about templates for advocacy. I believe those are on the websites of the various advocacy organizations. Um, those can help uh, us both with the Congress, the White House, and with our other communities where we need support. I see Glory Eon. Ah, my cousin. My cousin. Um, well, uh, he's talking, uh, has a question and Bobby Ann Mazeros um, as well. We can answer those by direct message. Um, I do wish to take the opportunity here to announce the door prize winners. The Hydro Flask goes to Pam Steffes and the David Boxley Formline t-shirt goes to Bobby Ann Mazeros. Congratulations. Um, and I thank everyone else that participated on this forum. And I thank in particular the panelists that took their valuable time and energy to participate on the panel today. I'm sure they are available for questions uh, directly. If you see them in the communities, um, uh, feel free to uh, follow up on these issues. Again, we'll follow up by direct message to those questions that we couldn't get to answer. Thank you all. Thank you for participating. And again, Colonel Chi Shawa. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. Chi Shawa. Okay, Colonel Chi.